Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our next panel. Does America First Mean America Alone? Featuring Senator Joni Ernst, Fred Flights of yes, Center for the Security Policy, and Representative oh. Roger Williams, moderated by Town Hall's Katie Pavlich. <laughs> Good afternoon, CPAC. We are so excited and grateful to be here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started with the interest of time at stake. Uh, the question of America's role in the world is always a big one, because I think many in this room would agree, and we'll talk about this on the panel, America has a very important role to play in the world when it comes to leadership, advancing freedom, advancing democratic ideas. And so I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves and give some opening remarks about where you think America stands in the world today. And then we'll get into some of the policies that the administration has put forward in terms of America first does not mean necessarily America alone. So we'll start with the senator from Iowa, Joni Ernst. Oh, thank you, everybody. It is great to be here at CPAC. Thank you. It's a great opportunity on this panel to talk about a question that I have been asked a lot, and that is uh, America first. Does that mean America is alone? And I would say absolutely not. It just simply means that America is leading from a position of strength, and I appreciate that very much. <laughs> President Trump has been very courageous in his interactions around the globe, and we have had many folks in the past, those that have talked to me, especially on national security issues all around the globe, they have asked, where is America's leadership? Now, mind you, that was in the Obama administration. Today, they no longer ask that. They see America's leadership and positioning around the world, and, and I do appreciate that very much. Now, um, it is of extreme importance to me because I do serve on the Armed Services Committee. I am a veteran of uh, the United States uh, Iowa Army National Guard as well, Ar U.S. Army Reserves and Iowa National Guard. And so now I serve as the chairman of the subcommittee on emerging threats and capabilities. So we watch this very closely. But again, I want to reemphasize that America first does not necessarily mean America alone. It just means that we have retaken that leadership position in the world. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Mr. Flights, we'll go to you next. It's great to be here. Uh, Senator, I agree with everything that Thanks, you just Brad. said. Uh, I'm a former CIA analyst, and I recently was chief of staff to perhaps the best national security advisor in nation's history, John Bolton. Yay! <laughs> I, when I think of America first, I think we could say Americans first, because America first really represents a backlash against the globalists, against the liberal elite who have put forward foreign policies that leave the American citizen, the American worker behind. Trade deals that are great for the liberals but that do nothing for the American worker. And international agreements like the Iran nuclear agreement and the Paris agreement that the American people oppose but the liberal elite wanted anyway. And the president is standing up to the establishment. He's standing up to the globalist to make sure that American foreign policy reflects the interests of our country and the interests of the American people. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Congressman Roger Williams. Well, thank you. I'm Roger Williams. I rep I'm from Texas and uh, uh, represent Texas in the United States Congress. But I think America sits in one of the best spots it's ever been for many, many years. Our friends are beginning to trust us again. Our enemies are beginning to fear us, as it should be. And I think America must lead. It's not America alone. It's America first, granted. But America must lead because when America leads, the world is hungry for leadership. Uh, myself being a business person, I know that people that are leaders still want to follow. And uh, we, are, uh, we have a great leader right now who's putting us at the pedestal, and, and uh, I think we're sitting in a great position. Now, I represent Fort Hood, the largest military base in America. And I think that we must, I think America must be strong across the world socially, economically, and militarily. And I think we are certainly there. And I had a chance to go to Iraq just several months ago and see our troops over there and to see those young men and women uh, that are fighting for freedom and liberty. It just reminds you that America is first, America's leading, 
and America must lead this world out of a lot of problems we have, and I feel a small part in it, like Senator Ernst does and, and others, uh, that we are on the right course, and I plan to stay in on that course with President Trump all the way. All right. Well, I'm sure all of you uh, know what the news has been for the past week. President Trump has been in Vietnam for the second summit with uh, North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. I want to go to you, Mr. Fights, first, because you recently wrote a book titled The Coming North Korean Nuclear Nightmare. Uh, what was your response to what happened this week and how the president has been handling the situation? Well, the purpose of the summit was to try to get Kim Jong-un to live up to the commitments he made at the Singapore summit last year. The president accomplished a lot, and I had the privilege of discussing North Korea with him about 10 day days ago. In fact, we both saw the we president in, 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 in Palm Beach. He's very pleased with this halt in nuclear and missile testing, which is setting back these programs, but we have to move North Korea to act on its commitments to denuclearize. What we saw in Vietnam was an act of leadership. We know from history that our, when, foreign, when American officials go to these events, they can't help but take a deal, even a bad deal. It's hard to walk away. The president walked away because he wants a good deal. He doesn't want to appeal to the globalists. He just doesn't want to have a ceremony to celebrate something that does not promote American interests. He's holding out for a good deal. He laid out to the North Koreans, this is what a good deal has to stand for. And I'm just proud of him for walking away for a bad deal. And if only John Kerry had done that when he was negotiating that disastrous nuclear deal with Iran, we'd be a lot better off today. Senator Ernst, my question to you is about the next steps in the North Korea process. If the president is able to get some kind of deal with the North Koreans for denuclearization, the Senate will have to weigh in on what those terms are going to be, if it's going to be any kind of lasting, uh, have any la lasting impact. So based on the, the topics that you've worked on uh, in your office, being on the Armed Services Committee, what do you see that looking like? And are we going to need our allies to help us? How do we hold China accountable for keeping up with that deal? Absolutely. I think for next steps moving forward, I think we would all agree on this panel that we do require complete denuclearization of North Korea in order to ensure the safety of the peninsula, our allies in the region, as well as our folks here on the homeland. We focus a lot on nuclearization or denuclearization of North Korea, but we also have to understand they have other capabilities as well, chemical agents, biological agents. So all across the board, we have to make sure that we are safeguarding our own people. And yes, will that require uh, our allies? Of course it will. Um, China, we typically don't think of as an ally, but in this case, they are very close to North Korea, and we can use them strong arming the North Koreans a little bit. There can also be not only a stick approach, but also a carrot approach. And you heard the, the president talking the other day about how North Korea really could be an economic powerhouse, but that's if it follows the United States example. But it will take a number of our allies stepping up and assisting us with that both stick and carrot approach with North Korea. And this is going to be a long haul, folks, and I, I applaud the president for getting up and walking away. Um, the deal wasn't right for the United States of America, and the president squarely put uh, the responsibility back on Kim Jong-un. Glad he did what he did. Yeah, and we also have to hold the UN accountable because uh, China and Russia are uh, violating UN sanctions against North Korea as we speak, and they don't seem to have anything to say about how to hold them accountable. Uh, but Congressman Williams, I think a lot of people look at the North Korea problem, which is decades long, and say, how is it that a guy who can't even get an operable airplane to fly to Vietnam can be such a threat to not just the United States, but the rest of the world with his nuclear arsenal? Well, I think the fact of the matter is uh, he's a hard guy to figure out. Uh, he's frankly dangerous. Yes. And I think that's one thing that President Trump has done, has been able to go see him and begin to uh, talk some sense or whatever, talk some common approach to him. But I think the world is fearful because they have nothing. Uh, they, ha they do not have an economy. Like you say, he rode a train that his father had built for him for 78 hours to get to the meeting. So uh, I think the best thing that the president is doing, he's talking about, frankly, Capitalism. We're all capitalists, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, he's talking about capitalism. He used Vietnam as an example of where North Korea could be with the opportunity of freeing the people and having an economy. And I think that's where we're heading. But also, uh, I think he's a person that you really have to be careful on what he says, what he does, because his track record of trust 
has not been that good, and I think the president is beginning to, uh, beginning to give him options that he's beginning to consider. So you mentioned capitalism, which is something uh, then you automatically think of socialism given the political environment we're in, and also going into our region, Venezuela. Uh, I want to talk about what's happening there. And given the administration's decision to pull troops out of Syria without, with the 400 still staying, how did we kind of square the circle on getting more involved in Venezuela? John Bolton was at a White House press briefing, and his notebook said 5,000 troops to Bolivia as an option uh, on the table. Uh, he wasn't hiding it from the press. So can you please explain why we need to be involved in Venezuela? What is at stake there? And what are the implications and interests for the United States? Well, the 5,000 troops written on John Bolton's notepad may have been pranking the press. We don't know. Uh, Mr. Bolton has a sense of humor. He could have been sending a message to the, to the Maduro regime. Uh, the president feels very strongly that we can't have U.S. troop presences in places like Syria indefinitely. And he's trying to find a way to do the right thing, but also to bring our troops home. And I think that that's the right approach. And he's trying to find a way to do it right. In Venezuela, I don't think the president is planning on invading. He has put together a, a, a multilateral coalition to pressure the discredited Majuro regime to leave office. And we did something daring. We, represented, we, we recognized Juan Guaido, who is now the legal president, acting president of the country because he was recognized as such by the parliament. And we organize a large number of states, including European states, who did not want to come with us on this. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to create momentum to get the military and members of the government to do the right thing and to join Guaido and get Maduro out. I think it's going to be hard because Maduro is backed by the Cuban security agents, uh, but I think there's some hope. We can see defections from the um, Venezuelan military. There, there aren't a lot, but they're starting to accelerate, and I'm hopeful we're going to have a peaceful resolution. Uh, Senator Ernst, when President Trump and uh, Ambassador, former Ambassador John Bolton, National Security Advisor, officially recognized Guaido as the pre new president of Venezuela, they didn't just do it as a coup, as many on the left have said and many in the media have uh, implied. They used the Venezuelan constitution to embolden the people who were in the streets and use their own system to help them uh, get Maduro out. However, Maduro isn't going. He's uh, burning aid trucks with medicine and uh, food on them from coming into the country. Uh, there are military defections, but not as many as I think the United States had hoped for initially. Where do we go from here, and why, again, is it in the U.S. interest to be backing up a, a, a change in leadership in that country? Well, uh, going back to uh, humanitarian crisis that we see all around the globe, and we see that on our southern border as well, uh, many of the countries in that region will absorb a lot of that impact. Um, these are allies that we have in that region. Now, I don't agree necessarily with just deploying our troops anywhere for any reason. I think we do have to be very cautious about that and make sure that we're not engaging where we're not necessarily needing to engage troops. But we do want to make sure that we are stabilizing that region. And if we can do that through many other means other than troops, um, we certainly want to try that first, whether it's diplomatic relations, whether it is utilizing allies other than you know, the United States, um, assisting them with the processes that might help stabilize uh, Venezuela. That is very important. Um, making sure that that aid gets in is also very important. We have seen this many times over where the United States has been engaged in those types of humanitarian uh, crises, providing support for those that are delivering food supplies, medical supplies, and so forth. So there's a number of reasons that could come forward and be presented to Congress in order to just justify uh, military involvement in Venezuela, but I think there are many other ways that we can be involved before we actually engage troops. So I think it's important that it comes to Congress, we talk about it, and we have a thorough discussion before we move forward with any of those types of activities. Now, Congressman, what's happening in Venezuela is a result of a socialist system completely collapsing. And as we celebrate Ronald Reagan uh, this weekend at CPAC, it's important to look at why America wants to eradicate communism throughout the world, why it's beneficial to American interests to have uh, democratic allies who believe in the free market. Can you talk a little bit about how having Juan Guaido take back Venezuela and give back its wealth, it used to be a very wealthy country, and implementing more of a free market system and turning Venezuela again into an ally for the United States would be better than uh, 
having Maduro stay. Well, there's no question about it, and we're, we're supporting the right, the, the right guy. I mean, uh, Venezuela, uh, just not too long ago, was one of the richest nations there was in the world, and we see now what socialism does to a, to a, 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 a great economy. And so I think we're doing the right thing in supporting him. The humanitarian issues are a big reason we need to. But I think it, uh, it also is a reminder for all of us in this country that socialism doesn't work. Right. It's just not going to work. It hadn't worked. And we've got, to, uh, we've got to defend what we believe is the greatest thing we know is capitalism. It's a great example of what happens when you lose control. And it's, uh, it's something that we need to be, uh, as a country, as a capitalistic nation, understand that if you're not careful, things can turn the other way. So we have to, we have to support the, uh, the, the new leadership. We're doing a great job. I feel like the others, said, I'm not sure we need to send troops in right now, but, uh, but supporting with supplies and, and, uh, is the best way to go. But let this be a reminder to us that capitalism doesn't work. Look at Cuba, look at Venezuela, and look at America, the greatest country in the world. We need to stay that way, and we will stay that way by sticking with the, uh, the things we believe in, the leadership that we have today. Mr. Flights, I think that the, the Venezuela situation over the last couple of months and the embrace of Guaido is actually a perfect example of America first, but not America alone. America had the leadership to go in first and endorse Guaido and say Maduro has to leave, but they did it in conjunction with a number of different allies across the world, and eventually the ones that weren't on the initial push came in behind the ones that were. So the administration was criticized for saying this is President Trump doing this by himself with no leadership, uh, no ability to really understand what's going on. The rest of the world disagrees with him. Well, 50 plus countries later who agree with the United States and are backing Wido, and you look at who's on the other side, China, Russia, Cuba. Um, can you talk a, bit, a, a little bit about the kind of process of getting that many countries to not just support the United States and their leadership, but to support uh, getting Venezuela back to democracy and a free market system? Katie, that's a great question. First of all, we know America First is not isolationism. Obviously, it is not. But this also reflects the sophistication of the foreign policy machine that's being run by John Bolton and Mike Pompeo. The media is not going to give them any credit for that, but I've participated in interagency meetings in the National Security Council, and it is quite an impressive operation. The president is getting very good advice from, from his national security advisors on some very difficult questions. Uh, you know, the left just can't get over this. They keep. They, attacking the administration for being amateurish or not for knowing what they're doing. But look, this was really an expert uh, operation of diplomacy to put all these nations together. We started it, but we didn't start it alone. We had other nations behind us, but we knew the right time to recognize Guaido after he was recognized by the uh, Venezuelan parliament. Uh, it, I think it was an example of how foreign policy is working, but also how the America First approach to foreign policy works. Senator, you're nodding your head down there. Do you have something to add? Yes, I, I just think of this example, Venezuela, but I think about our actions all around the globe too, um, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's our support that we have given to Ukraine in their war against Russia. Um, we have so many other countries. Yes, thank you, we love Ukraine. Um, the support that we give to these other countries, we're not alone in doing that. We have built our alliances through many decades of very hard work. Um, so it's not just Venezuela, but we are, we are showing leadership all around the globe. That is America first. When we are stepping forward and we are leading and others are following. So Venezuela is just one of the more recent examples that we have seen all around the globe of America first, America leadership. So Congressman, you can't get away from President Trump's foreign policy without talking about trade. This is a huge part of the way that he's um, negotiated with North Korea, the way that he's uh, been implementing sanctions and economic uh, costs to Russia through allowing new gas to come into to, to Europe through other means. Um, can you talk a little bit about how trade is directly tied to President Trump's foreign policy and how he's used that to really put American interests uh, first? Well, he's used it as good as any president we've had. I mean, I'm a business person. Uh, I'm, I'm on car dealerships, so I know about negotiations and trade. And he is one of the great ones. And the fact that he's been able to uh, uh, 
sell these, you know, sell the, sell the fact of, of, of trading uh, has really been responsive to this to, to this country, and he's done a, fa a fantastic job. And he's uh, selling, and of course we got tariffs. We're talking about tariffs. We're talking about China, various other things. He's using a big stick. We've seen some of these co countries that have not wanted to talk to America at all. All of a sudden, they're waking up and saying, "You know, maybe I better talk to this guy." And uh, so we're seeing some good things happen. I think the way he's dealing with China. Uh, it, it is the right way. Uh, they're, they're beginning to come to the table. And so I think he's on the right track. As, as we have assets, they have assets. Let's trade, but let's be fair. And uh, I think we're heading in a great direction from an economy standpoint. I think the American economy is, is going to continue to be strong because of his, his efforts in selling America to the world. Right. You, we've got the greatest product there is. The United States of America, free markets, capitalism, low unemployment. He's selling that to the world, and the world's responding. I think he's doing a great job. And, and he's really used very specific issues of trade. So in the last couple of weeks, he met with uh, uh, representatives from the Chinese government who were in Washington, D.C. on behalf of President Xi, and he signed a deal where we're now going to export more soybeans, which is beneficial to uh, our, our economy, but also allows us not to be buying so many Chinese goods. So can you talk a little bit about that, how, how that impacts our foreign policy and also trade in communities like yours? Absolutely, and it is very important to the people of Iowa, so that soybean deal really does help out. It, it bridges the gap. There's a lot of pressure on American farmers right now, and, and for Iowans, China is our fourth largest uh, export market. So you would think then that farmers, maybe they aren't supporting President Trump, but in all actuality, the farmers that I'm hearing from, they are saying, we stand behind the president. And, and a quote that I'll give you from one of the, my soybean farmers, interestingly enough, uh, after our last Ag Roundtable, at the end of the, the meeting, he slapped his hand on the table, he stood up and he said, I understand why the president is doing this, and I get it and we stand behind him on this. He said, what I don't understand is why we didn't have a president that did this years ago. So President Trump is standing up for American farmers. The Chinese have treated us so badly, um, not just as, as uh, Mr. Navarro stated with forced technologies, transfers, intellectual property theft, but also with our commodities and trying to renegotiate contracts to lower costs where it hurts our American farmer, our American rancher. It is vitally important that we get this right, and that's why we're glad that he is negotiating the way he is. Um, we hope that the Chinese deal comes to fruition very soon, but I'm sure that the president is going to come out with a very good deal, which will put America first. So, Congressman, I want to talk about China, because China is, is something that is brought up as a threat, a strategic threat, geopolitical threat, but people, I feel like, kind of brush them off as just doing what's just in the best interest of them. I was in China last year, I mean, you talk about the, the Belt and Road Initiative, where they want to run, you know, uh, trade routes all the way through uh, Asia and Europe and Africa that it's not a geopolitical project, it's simply just about trade, which anybody who knows anything about China knows that that's not true. Um, how much of a threat is China, and is, is their ability to be patient, to have a 100-year plan, an advantage to them compared to, to the way that we do things, which is in a much faster pace? Well, I think China, they certainly uh, are somebody we, uh, militarily we have to be aware of them, and of course economically we have to be aware of them. I think their choice would be to defeat us economically as opposed to militarily. That's why I enter President Trump to begin to slow them down uh, from what they did. They're buying our intellectual property. They're, they're, they're doing a lot of involvement in our country. We are aware of it. They're buying real estate in our country. Uh, and uh, we are now more aware of it now probably than we were ever before because of where President Trump is on, being, on acknowledging China. So we have to be very careful with them militarily, but also I do think, as I said, their goal would be to beat us internally, to beat us uh, from an economic standpoint. And the way we're going now with uh, 3 and 4 percent growth and low unemployment, I think we've showed them that we have the best economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that by them beginning to, to lower some of their tariffs and talk more about it and so forth. So let's do not lose sight of the fact China, we are aware of China. We're not afraid of China, but we are aware of China economically and uh, socially, militarily, all those things. But we're on the right track, and I think we've slowed them down to the point that uh, they uh, they may even have surprised themselves that they're uh, they have issues that yeah, they're they haven't to have had before. Some, some domestic issues of their own. Uh, speaking of China, you know, 
convincing our allies that China is a problem I, it has been an interesting one to watch. Uh, I was in Israel in, in last fall, and we met with some Israeli officials who seemed to think that just accepting money from China wouldn't come with any strings attached. For example, China offering to build a $10 billion speed train for them, and them thinking that that was just going to be okay. And when you look at the geo political situation in the Middle East, of course Israel needs the United States. And they didn't seem to think that building that relationship with China would become a problem for them when it came to their relationship with the US. And many of us beg to differ, and I would be curious about what your perspective is on that. Well, um, repeated administrations have underestimated the threat from China for years. They've let a China get along with uh, trade deals that take advantage of us, that steal intellectual property, that favor Chinese companies, that uh, basically our, the trade deficit is something that we've tolerated. I think part of it was we thought, well, China is a developing nation, we'll fix this down the road. But this is the first president to stand up to the Chinese and say we want free and fair trade. We want you to stop stealing our intellectual property. Right. It's, it's a big deal. I mean, our companies spend billions of dollars developing advanced uh, defense and, 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 and uh, factory uh, technologies, and the Chinese are getting it for a song by stealing it, often stealing it from the factories that our companies are building in China. China. Right. This has to stop. I, I wanted to add one other point. Senator uh, Ernst made a great point about American leadership. This has a lot to do with America first. America first means a strong, incredible United States, and, and that is crucial to the national security of our country and to global security. The president inherited some real serious messes on the world stage because of Barack Obama's policy of leading from behind, which was what he did in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and strategic patience for North Korea. Right. And America First is countering these disastrous policies that really left uh, Mr. President Trump, an enormous disaster to deal with. And I think he's able to deal with it. We've made so much credit to North Korea because he is dealing with these messes. He's thrown out the diplomatic rule book, and I think he's really making the world a safer place. So we don't have much time left, so I want to get over to Europe here. Um, while the president's policy is America first, he also wants other countries to put themselves first and to pull their own weight. So we've heard a lot about Russia over the last two years. One of my favorite moments of the Trump presidency in terms of foreign policy was when he went to the NATO headquarters in 2017, the new fancy building, and he stood there and told them that their building was too expensive and they were spending all of this money on these fancy new offices. And then he stood there and said, you guys need to pay your 2%, not because we're asking you to pay more, but we're asking you to pay what you have pledged to pay in this alliance. Now, he was criticized for throwing our NATO allies under the bus, um, you know, somehow asking NATO to pull their fair share and to beef up their defense forces against Russia was seen as a pro-Russia move. Um, and here we are now with all of these NATO countries, at least for the most part, paying their 2%. So I'd, I'd like to get from all of you what your perspective is on where we are with NATO and how President Trump's tough love has actually led to a stronger United States and a stronger alliance uh, in Europe. Uh, I, I'll go ahead and start because uh, I think Jen, uh, Jen Stoltenberg would say that America has done very well for him and for NATO and, and our allies by um, allowing them to step up to the plate a little bit more and contribute. And that is really important that everybody have ownership of, of NATO. And they are getting where they should have been many, many years ago. I just returned uh, last week. I want to push back because uh, I would say that the president is not pro-Russia, as many of the in the media would like to portray him. Um, I just returned from Ukraine last week, where this president and this Congress has provided the Ukrainian army with the military equipment, the lethal aid necessary to push back the Russians from the eastern U Ukrainian front. That was this president that did that. And the, or excuse me, the Ukrainian general that is in charge of operations out on that eastern front, he said it was the javelins provided by the American military, the American people, that pushed the Russian tanks back even further out of range. So that was this president, where we have seen inaction in the past, 
we have seen action by this president against Russia. So um, that is because we have leadership. That is because we are engaging with our allies. And I'm very glad for it. And I think the American people are glad for it as well. Well, the European states had a commitment to pay their way in NATO, and they weren't paying it. Various administrations said, please pay, and we didn't really push them. And, you know, when we don't make these states hold up for their commitments, uh, we're less credible. The president says you have to pay your bills, and this is a serious matter. Just like he says to the Chinese, you can't cheat us in international trade. It, it's, it's demonstrating a credible United States on the world stage. And, and look, I've seen the president talk to foreign leaders, and you don't want to cross his president. He's tough with them, and I, I can't give specifics, but, but I mean, he stands up to rogue states, rogue leaders who try to take advantage of us, and I think he is making America safe again. Congressman? Well, I'm glad he did it. I mean, look, in, 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 in real life terms, you can't drive the car and not pay for the car. <laughs> and, you know, there's a thing called return on investment. I mean, we're, we got the investment, we're getting whatever return, but they, they can't get, you can't get return on no investment. And so he did the right thing in, in telling people to step up and get skin in the game. And as you said, Senator, uh, when you got skin in the game, you're, you're more apt to follow how things are going. And he did the right thing. He did something that very few people have done in the past. But, you know, the United States of America, the greatest country in the world throughout history, has financed a lot of opportunity for people. And we haven't been paid back. And I think the fact that he would tell the other nations, you need to step up, you need to pay your fair share, uh, enjoy the results, but get return on investment, not return on no investment, and drive the car, but pay for the car. I think uh, it's, it's created a new level of responsibility in the world from other countries that just thought that we were never going to say anything. It just go away. Well, it's not going away because we don't have an infinitesimal amount of money, but we have an infinitesimal amount of energy to help people succeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so we'll get to closing remarks. As we continue to celebrate America as a leader in the world, being respected again in the world, where do you see us going in the next year when it comes to our place in the world and what this president is going to be able to do? I think it is really important that we continue to interact with our allies and, again, do that from a position of strength. That is very important. And again, I want to say how courageous I think President Trump is for actually uh, throwing out that diplomatic playbook. Is that how you expressed it? I, you know, I, just, I think that's pretty... <laughs> pretty amazing that, that our president has gone against all um, status quo, shaking things up, doing things differently, but in a way that really does position us quite well. We are America first, America leading, but we are showing our allies that we are committed to them as well. And so I think we will continue down that path with uh, President Trump's leadership, and we will certainly support America being first. The, the president has reestablished credibility on the world stage. He, he has established himself as a powerful and credible leader the world nations have to deal with. I think China is seeing this. I think we could get a good deal with China. I think North Korea has understood that this is a credible president. He's not going to settle for a bad deal. And I'm so proud of the president for pulling out of the fraudulent Iran nuclear deal. I played a role in advising people who did that. Uh, this did not stop Iran from, from pursuing nuclear weapons. We know Iran is still sponsoring terrorism. So I think our country is on a, on a very good trajectory after the disastrous foreign policy of Barack Obama. Last word to you, Congressman. Well, I think, I think the next 12 months are going to be great for this country and great for the world because we're leading again. Mm -hmm. And the fact that uh, President Trump got elected because he wanted to change things, and that bothered a lot of folks, but he has changed things. He's done everything he said he would do. Uh, the world sees that, and I think we've got a great 12 months ahead of us. I mean, he is, we are leading. We are the best, and uh, we are, are going to see, we're going to see things ch change with China, I believe, to our benefit. We're going to see uh, Mexico, Canada begin to come together for some great things. Uh, we're going to see Europe. We're going to see Russia, I think, continue to be on their heels. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but we've got to support our president. And the fact of the matter is, a lot of people aren't, but all of us that believe in him, believe in conservative values, believe that America is the greatest country in the world, second to none, we've got to stand with him, we've got to walk with him, we've got to speak with him to make things happen. I look forward to the next 12 months. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.